Glad to, glad to be with you. God bless you. Can we welcome our campus to say hi to them? What's happening in South Shore Plant City? What's going on? Amen. Delighted that you're here today. We love you. Can we go to the Lord? Father, we are, we're so thankful. God, thank you that uh, you give us so much that you're present in our lives. Thank you as you're healing people who are uh, struggling, especially with sickness. And Father, we thank you for uh, families getting together. Lord, bind that up and uh, make it gracious in every way. <laughs> oh, Lord, we love you and we thank you for this season. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Whatever you do at family dinner, don't offend other people. <laughs> There's just a little tip. God bless you. And uh, I mean, you can talk about everything. You just got to do it in the spirit of love and grace, all right? I know that many of you are, are looking forward to uh, next weekend or next week and celebrating Thanksgiving uh, and so on. We are in a series called Occupy the Gates, Occupy the Gates, and we've talked about the gates and we've talked about the walls, and today we're going to talk about mountains, all right? Mountains of influence. Dr. Bill Bright, some of you are familiar with him. Campus Crusade for Christ, he was the leader, um, and he was the one that early in his life, when he was serving the Lord, <clears throat> he just said he was in the parking lot, I think it was at a university, and he got on his knees, and he said to the Lord, he said, Lord, use me uh, right here, right now, for the rest of my life, I will be in bondage, in slavery to you, and if you don't know that term in scripture, the Bible says that we're slaves to one thing or another, either to Satan or to God. And he said, God, I'm your slave. I'll do, I'll do whatever you want me to do, God. And the Lord used him. Campus Crusade for Christ was amazing, and just amazing outpouring, still going on today. And another man, uh, also in a youth movement, Lauren uh, uh, Cunningham. Um, I didn't have my glasses on, so I couldn't read what was on the page. God bless you. That's what happens I guess it was probably 10, 12 years ago, I was reading my Bible while I was on stage. Does this happen to you? Uh, did, your, did your sight go away overnight? Yes. I was literally, I was reading my Bible and my arm couldn't get long enough and I was like, I think my sight is gone. Now I can see 2015, I can see in the auditorium, I can see all the way to the back. I, I, it's perfectly, but right here, I, I can't see very well. There was a lady that was uh, after service one day. I said, hey, did you find what was in your purse? She was sitting in the balcony. She goes, oh, oh my gosh, you can see me? I said, yeah, no foul, no foul, no foul. So I can see you, I just can't see my text. Um, and I can see you in South Shore and Plant City too. God is good. What's up? What's up? Uh, Lauren Cunningham, he was the YWAM leader. Uh, youth with a Mission, and um, actually, I'll put my glasses on so that I can read it for you. Yep, it's Youth with a Mission, YWAM. In 1975, both of these men had a vision from the Lord, and then they later found out, it's probably months later, six months later, they found out that they had the vision or the dream about seven areas of influence, and they had it on the same week in 1975. And so this later, what happened to these two men, youth leaders, was actually now branded and named the seven mountains of influence. And I want you to see them just as a, a, a graphic picture of what they are. Seven areas, and these are ways of thought, okay? Ways of thinking, these are structures, orientations that affect the entire world and how the world thinks, okay? Uh, the church and religion, and then the institution of family, education, government, media and technology, arts, entertainment, and sports, and then business, and in that is science and technology with business there, okay? And so what happens is, is these, uh, uh, these mountains shape how we think. Now, uh, uh, if you would have said 50 years ago that we would be talking about terms like gender fluidity in our schools, I would have said no way. Are you with me? Gender fluidity is talking about non-binary gender. In other words, um, what God said, male and female, that we would be adapting and changing how we think about what gender is, or for you know something a little simpler, you know, like Common Core. What? How many of you are familiar with Common Core? Four plus, four plus four is eight, not really. Four plus four, you know, four plus six minus two, round the one, carry the three, and you come up with an ampersand, that's eight. <laughs> common core, look, common core goes 
all the way. How many of you have had frustration with the Common Core homework? I mean, what's up? And that we would be talking about in our country socialism and activism in a way. You can put up the little thing that I found on activism, fourth grade activism. Activism is fine in our country. It's part of the fabric of who we are. But the activism that's taking place today because of the culture of our thought that's taking place in these mountains is not like, can I just say this? This is not like Martin Luther King's activism. Okay, you can take that down. It's not. Let me tell you why. One distinguishing factor, there's no love. There's no love, there's no love for people, and there's no love for country in it. And so there is a distinction that's taking place, and these institutions, these formations, these mountains form how we think, and they form the generation behind us how they think, and eventually how we act. Romans 1, says this, and professing to be wise, they became, come on, say it with me. Professing to be wise, they became, come on, say it big. Professing to be wise, they became, fools. You know why? Because we say to God, God, I don't want you in the mountain. I don't want you in education. I don't want you in arts and media and literature. I don't want you in government. I don't want you. And so there's this divisional thing that happens. I'm going to talk about that in a second. What happens is there's a small group of people that run these mountains. There's an elite group that run the mountains. And whatever those uh, folks say is what most of the people in the mountain do. You can go to the next slide. And so in the church years ago, there was a guy named Rob Bell. I don't know if you remember him, but he was teaching this strange theology about eternity. It is not what the Bible says. How many of you believe that every one of the mountains need to agree with what the Bible says? Because what the Bible says is a higher law than any law we have. And, and, and so some of you are like, no, I don't believe so. Every mountain belongs to God. He created all of them. He owns the mountains. God is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that formed government. That's why civil government has a basis. God's the one that that formed moral law. LGBTQ has been incredible in changing, shifting their ideology from a moral issue to a civil issue. Some Some of you are waiting on me. That's why it has such permeation, 3%. So so listen, what we're talking about today is actually cutting Christians loose to go into the seven mountains and to have influence. And to say, my influence isn't just in the church. I mean, I'm I'm so glad we're here and I'm glad we're worshiping Jesus and I pray you worship him in your car. I pray you take your worship outside the church. But God wants worship in the family. And God wants worship in education. And God wants worship in the government. And God wants education in the media. God wants worship. He wants worship in the arts. He wants worship in business. And so, and so I don't know what that was. But wherever you go, God wants you to bring him with you because he's the owner of all these things. There's a very small group of people who affect. 3% of our country has infiltrated or used very wisely every one of these mountains. You can go back. You can go back. Every one of these mountains to uh, bring forth a civil agenda. They change it from moral to civil. So why can't Christians use the same kind of philosophy and take back what's God's originally? What's God's originally? It's originally his. So in the family, focus on the family is a good uh, uh, example of this. And, and man, what uh, impact focus on the family has had around the world. When you think about education, there's a small group of people in Washington who set the tone for all the school superintendents around the nation. And so what comes through that small group of people, remember, when the nation was founded, 230 of our original institutions and mainly those who are the Ivy League, the most elite, prestigious schools in the United States of America, how many of you remember what they were when they started? Seminaries. Does that blow your mind? There were seminaries. Well, you don't know what a seminary is. It's an institution of religion to train pastors to bring the gospel to the world. That's where our education started. Where our education is today is those who were <laughs> uh, they were partying in the 1960s. Are you with me, Woodstockers? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> those who were partying are setting the politics for every educational system in America. How, in other words, they're saying, this is how we think. I want you to take your young people. I don't know what's 
What's moving around? If it's me or my mic or I'm not sure what it is. Can you guys hear that out there? Yes. You can. Yes. <laughs> All right. Maybe I need a handheld. Or maybe the Lord's coming back. Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. Let, me, let me do this. Let me do something that I usually do with my computer when it's failing. Let me turn it off for a second. If I was to use my preaching voice, now I could project. Let me turn it back on. Let's see if we can get it. Now, there's something going on with the wires. All right, I'm going to turn it off. Okay. Now I have to turn this one on. Green. Go. <laughs> Woo! Okay. Technology is awesome till it's not. Okay. Um, where was I? All right, education. There's a small group of people in education that are making the decisions for everyone. You know that Hillsborough County has the eighth largest school district in America? The eighth largest school district in all of America. And there are probably eight people, maybe even less than that, five, who are making decisions for all 200 and something thousand students. All of them. So here's what I want to say to you. You matter and what you say matters, and what you do matters, and your involvement matters. It matters. In Washington, there's about 300 people. If you take the power consolidation, you pull it together, about 300 people. And amazingly, in culture, uh, you know, every couple hundred years or so, there's a culture that steps up and has the ability to form culture, not just in its own nation, but around the entire globe, and that is America. It's still the United States of America. And so these 300 that control the White House then control the national, the entire globe, and probably 90% of what takes place there, uh, uh, all the way to business and the banking system and all that's taking place there. Jump over there to business with me for a second. Science and technology and industry, there are two people People who have controlled, basically dominated the narrative for the coronavirus for almost two years. Two. Two people. Let me tell you why. Because media is a partner. You see, in every one of these mountains, there are spiritual entities. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, if you just write that down, the rulers, the authorities, the powers, and the spiritual forces. And so you might have rulers and authorities down here, but the spiritual forces, the principalities come up these mountains and they, there's glory in these mountains. Why? Because God created them. And so those who rule these sections share or take the glory. You know, the, uh, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air for a reason. That's real quiet in here. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, but Jesus said that you and me could go to the prince of the power of the air and take back our airtime. Yeah. Media, the media and arts and entertainment, media especially, has gotten to this consolidation of what they do. Just in 1983, you can put this slide up, there were 50 companies, and the diversity in media was pretty broad. 50 companies who ran what we read, what we see, and what we hear. What's happened since then, this is just in 2011, everything, say everything. Everything you read, everything you hear, and everything you see on the other side of the television screen now is conglomerated into six companies. Six of them. So those six companies now own the airwaves for about 95 or 96% of everything Americans hear or read or see. Some of you were surprised, all right, GE, News Corp, Disney, Viacom, the mouse will take your stuff, y'all. <laughs> Viacom, Time Warner, and CBS. People were shocked to learn in the 2020 election that uh, Fox News is owned by Disney executives. Come on, somebody. You guys are like, they are? <laughs> yeah, they are. See, see, Disney executives know how to play both sides of the red and blue fence. How you guys doing? <laughs> you guys with me? So when you go to do a search, and, and okay, you can take this down now. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's what's happening. Uh, uh, the marketing of evil, all right? We've been so lied to so thoroughly, consistently that no longer, we no longer perceive the meaning of what we see nor understand what we hear. 
If you go on and you do searches, and every week I'm searching and looking, and if you go on and you're looking for something in particular that has to do with maybe a Christian uh, motive, it might be buried under three or four pages of media. Why? Because it's loaded what you see in the first place. It's loaded in what you see in the first place. So if we approach things and we know what we're approaching, then we have a better opportunity to walk into these mountains and have influence to walk in and to find our place in the mountains for the Lord Jesus. Ephesians 6, 12 says this, for we do not wrestle against, and I want you to think about your workplace, and I want you to think about the person who's over you, then the person who's over them, and then the person who's over them, and the person who's over them. We do not wrestle against Bill or Gina or Ann or Mike. Come on, somebody, can I get an amen? amen? We don't wrestle against them. We wrestle against we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers and spiritual forces. So in other words, if I have a spiritual perspective, then I won't have a divide in my mind and say, when I go to church, I mean, put it back up. When I go to church, I'm gonna be spiritual. The next one. See that? See the power of the Holy Spirit? Did you see that? Amazing. When I go to church, I'm gonna be spiritual. And when, I go to, and when I'm in my family, I'm gonna to try to be spiritual. But then when I get out in the world, everybody say the world. Now I have to do something different. I hear Christians say this all the time. I gotta man up. I gotta, I gotta man up. I gotta, I gotta woman up. I gotta, I gotta, I've gotta go out there and put my armor on and do these things. And, and here's what I want you to say. What you need is, is to be prophetic in government. What we need is to carry the power of the Holy Spirit in media. What we need is for us to, to understand the ways of God, the philosophies of God, the intention of God, and to understand that we're called to go into these mountains and to not make a divide and say our hiding place is here. No, our places to rule and reign are here. There's a mandate that the Lord wants to reinstitute for all of us, it's called a cultural mandate, and it's in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And here's, here's just a paraphrase, okay? You can go back and look at the scripture. He says to Adam and Eve, I want you to have dominion over the earth. You remember when Jesus came back, he said, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And, and the 72 were surprised when Jesus sent them out and said, I give you, I wanna say this to the whole church. Here's Jesus standing on stage. This is not Greg, this is Jesus. I give you authority to trample on the devil. That's what he told them. Okay, some of you are like, I don't think so. Well, 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 I want you to realize that Jesus thinks so. And so God didn't ask, God is asking every Christian to find their intelligence, to find their wherewithal, to find their power, to find the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to find the integrity of walking in the Lord and his truth, to walk in the words of Jesus, to speak the word of God, and to go into the mountain of your influence, and then to speak peace to the people who are there, that are the leaders, because what Jesus said to the 72 when he sent them out is he said, I don't want you to take anything. Don't take a staff, don't take food, don't take anything. I want you to take uh, bare bones minimum. Why? Because I want you to see the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to go to your boss or I want you to go into your school. I want you to go into that environment and I want you to carry in the Holy Spirit. And when you do, I want you to see the power that the Holy Spirit has. And when you do, you're gonna come back to me. They came back to Christ and they said, even the demons reply to us. Even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus said, don't worry about the demons. Take your place in the mountain. That's basically what he said. He said, take your place. Take your place. There's no secular, sacred divide. I want to just give us back as Christians the fact that God's glory has given you everything that you need to succeed. And these mountains are his. Come on, say it with me. They're his mountains. They're his mountains. They're, his mountains. They're not the devil's mountains. The devil doesn't own education. Come on, the devil doesn't own education. He doesn't. He doesn't own Washington. I know that's arguable. It's not his property. He doesn't own it. He doesn't own media and technology. He doesn't own it. I, I, we, we're starting to capitulate as American Christians and just say, there's nothing we can do. I'll tell you what we can do. You can fall on your face. We can pray. 
the entire church can start to pray. The entire church can start to pray, and that's what we're gonna do in January. That's why I'm telling you right now, because I want you to eat as much as you can between now and the end of the year, because we're gonna fast. Just eat all you can. I'm gonna ask you to fast. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask you to fast. I'm not gonna ask you to not have Coke. I'm gonna ask you to fast. I'm gonna ask you to fast. And in order to fast, if you're gonna be successful fasting, you've gotta go and read some things about fasting so that you can prepare yourself and your body because you can't, you know, if, if, if you're gonna, how many of you are runners? Just raise your hand in the Tampa campus if you're runners. Just, some of you, don't be shy. You can raise your hand or you're a runner. That's it, all right. You can't just go run a marathon tomorrow. You won't make it. Come on, somebody. You won't, you have to train. So you have to get ready to get ready to get ready to go. And so if, if we just say, I'm just gonna, uh, you know what I mean, I'm gonna eat everything I could eat and then the next day I'm gonna start fasting, you'll fail. You need to get yourself ready. You need to get your mind ready and you get your heart ready and get ready to fast. And then, so when we deplete ourselves like that, what God does is he fills us with the Holy Spirit. And then he starts saying and doing things that we could never do on our own. And then there's the power of God that starts to be resident in our lives. And we have this, this understanding that Jesus is present with us. All of this is in your notes. There's just, Ezekiel said in the temple that the temple was filled with the glory of God and we'll know that we've arrived. Why? When? Pastor, when will we have arrived? Whenever you have the manifest presence of God in your prayer room. In other words, when I say manifest, I don't mean an ethereal smoke. I mean that you, there is a presence that, that everyone in the room and you included could say, I don't know if I can see him, but I know he is here. I know he's here. The kind of worship that will take place uh, here in us, the kind of hunger that we need comes from prayer and fasting. It comes from a devotion. It comes from the power, the presence of God rolling into our lives and us saying to God, God, I beg you, I need you, you have to come. And the kind of presence that I'm talking about is that when we worship across our campuses and wherever you are online is that God comes so tangibly and so powerfully. Why? Because like baby chicks in a nest, all of our mouths are open simultaneously. You ever, see, you ever seen that? If you've not seen it, baby chicks don't sit quietly and ask for food. Baby chicks are like, I'm trying not to be obtuse. You with me? Come on, somebody, are you with me? They open their mouth and they are just, what, 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 what? Feed me. Come on, give me what you have, God. Come on. God, give me what you have. God, give me, give me, give me what you have. God, give me what you have. God, give me what you have. God, come on, God, come on, give me what you have. Come on, God, I, I need you so bad. My family needs you so bad. Listen, our children need us so bad. Our culture needs us so bad. Our culture needs Christians again. Our culture doesn't, mean, doesn't need mean people. Our culture means people. My gosh, I'm going so fast, I can't even get my words out. Our culture needs people who mean business with God. Right. Our culture needs people who'd say, uh, you know, to King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, great king, we're not, there's, I don't, you don't need to be angry, you don't need to be mad, you don't, but you need to say, I will not move from my position in standing with Jesus. I won't. I will not. I cannot. I can't. Whatever he says to do is what I'm going to do because he's the king of my life. You see, there are kings on these mountains and the kings will usurp, they'll try to usurp God and use their authority to get you to do what they, do, they want you to do instead of what God wants you to do. And God is saying, I want you to take back your dominion. That's, that's, the, that's the goal that God's trying to get in front of us. But we have to believe, church, listen, we have to believe that God can use us. And I, know, I don't know, it's a, challenge, a challenging proposition. I'm just gonna jump down, I'm gonna jump all the way down here. I went past the strategy, prayer and fasting, presence, the power of God. I want you to believe that God can use you. And there's a long list in scripture of those who are in scripture that we think are pretty good people that they thought they couldn't be used by God. Abraham was too old for God to use him. Come on, somebody. And, and I wanna just make this pronouncement. Abraham was older than anybody here. So don't disqualify yourself. Don't disqualify. Elijah had suicidal thoughts. Joseph, Joseph was abused and hated. Job went bankrupt. You remember what happened with Job? 
Moses had a speech problem. He told God, I can't. Gideon was afraid. He was really afraid. Some of you are afraid. I understand being afraid. You know that God doesn't care if we're afraid. God just cares if we stay afraid. God's like, I know that you're afraid. Just face your fear. I know that you're afraid. Oh, hail, mighty warrior. That's what he said to Gideon. Gideon was hiding. Gideon said, I'm the least person in the least clan, and I'm hiding in a wine press, and I, I, God, please don't come ask me to do something. God, please. Anybody have that feeling? Is this Come on, somebody, be honest with me. Could be honest. Come on, be honest. Can we be honest? You're like, can I just, can, you know what I mean? Can I go eat a steak? Yeah. Just, I, don't ask me. When I was in seminary, every seminary student, I want you to know, we have chapel in seminary, and every seminary student is afraid to go to chapel every week. And I'll tell you why. Because God's there. <laughs> and God might ask you to cross, crisscross the nations and go to Africa. And every time, you see, what God wants from us is he wants our yes. He wants us to say to him, God, yes, whatever it is. God, I'll do it. God, I'll I'll do it. I'll do whatever you say. I'll I'll do it. Wherever you take me, whatever you want to do, I'll do it. Gideon was afraid. Samson was a womanizer. (laughs) Hmm, I'm no, hmm. Mm. Lord Jesus, help us. Rahab was a prostitute. Noah had a drinking problem. Did you know that? Jeremiah couldn't contain his tears. Cried all the time. He's called the weeping prophet. I mean, you go in before the school board. (laughs) You know, you're invited to the White House. You know that God used him? He prophesied to the nations, to the nations, prophesied to the princes and kings of the earth because he had the fire of God in his belly. He said yes to the Lord, even in his shortcomings. Jacob was a cheater. David was a murderer. The man who patterned, who, whose heart belonged to God was so mistaken, so overwhelmed with his sin with Bathsheba that he, he murdered Bathsheba's husband. God still used him. God, God, matter of fact, the throne of David, the keys of David and the thrones of David come from this man who was marred, broken. Jonah ran from God. <laughs> Naomi was a widow. Peter denied Christ three times. Martha worried about everything. Come on, somebody. The disciples couldn't stay awake to pray for Jesus for one hour before he was crucified. And Paul, a Pharisee, was persecuted. He persecuted Christians. He actually killed Christians before he, came, he became one. And so what God is saying through the scripture, and he's saying it to you and he's saying it to me, is he's saying, I want to use you, so don't get in your own way. I want to use you. Don't tell me. Yeah, you can clap for that. Come on. He said, God is saying, God is saying, don't tell me that you're disqualified if I qualify you. Don't tell me you're too old. Don't tell me, don't tell me you're not strong enough. Don't tell me that you're not smart enough. Don't tell me that you don't have enough. Don't tell me, don't tell me what you've done because I want to tell you what I've done. I have placed my Holy Spirit inside of you and I want you to do something for me. I want you to live for me. I want you to give your life to me. Just a few months ago in March, we hosted a global awakening conference and Randy Clark and Bill Johnson were here. It was amazing. God was doing incredible things and It was the last night of the conference and right here at the Tampa campus, I was standing down here at the campus and I was singing to the Lord. There was a a band up and, you know, the leaders had gone and 52 hours of conference. I mean, after like hour 42, I was like, I love Jesus. I love him. I was, I I mean, you know that God, 52 hours, 52 hours. Let me tell you what God wants to do. He wants to break you down to fill you up. He needs you to be stripped. That's why, that's why we fast. He wants you to not have all of the normal stuff you have in your life so that he can speak to you. Sometimes he wants you depleted and tired and worn out so that he could pour in his glory. And we were singing a song and a lady came to me and, and there was a couple of people that prophesied. If you don't know what prophesy means, they, they're speaking what God would say. Prophecy is the words of, of God coming from the mouth of man, saying to somebody, not you're an evil sinner, not that. Everybody say, not that. Because anybody, anybody with any discernment can see anything that's wrong with somebody else. If you have discernment, you should look not in the speck of your brother's eye, but the plank in your own. 
Prophecy is saying what God sees in a person before it comes to pass. Prophecy is saying to a man, I see the glory of God on you and I see leadership in your life and I don't know whether you think you're qualified or not, but I know God says you're qualified and you should take your place now. Prophecy always brings us up to the next place with the Lord. It, it is an encouragement from the Lord is what the Bible says. It's encouragement from the Lord. So it was a lady that came and there was a couple of people that prophesied. We were worshiping. We're all right here at the Tampa campus and, and uh, uh, a lady brought to me an arrow and somebody, somebody prophesied and said, the enemy wants to take place or have his place here. And a lady came to me and said, I was walking the backside of the property and I found an arrow in the corner. I was praying and asking God, God, where is the enemy active here? And in the corner of the property, there's an arrow, a physical arrow. So the Lord, she was praying, asking the Lord, looking for signs. She brings the arrow to me. She says, I think this represents something. And I immediately in my spirit, I knew what it was. And the arrows, the representation that there's been stuff. Do you know, do you know when you start serving God, the enemy wants to start messing with your house. And so... The words went with the picture, and I got my son. We took the arrow outside, and when we broke the arrow, I said, Lord, you know the enemy's activity here, and we break it in the name of Jesus. And I took the arrow, and I went, boom. And when I, did, when I went like this, it went, boom. It made this big old noise. Both of us went, whoa. And then we went, high fives, let's go worship. <laughs> because that's what you need to do with the devil. Right? That's what you need to do before, before the devil. With God, you're intimate. With men, you're a servant. With the devil, you're a ruler. That's what God says. That's what God says. That's not what, don't mess around. Don't mess around and approach the devil without God. He will beat your fanny. But if you, don't mess around. Do stand in the authority Jesus has given you and tell the devil where he can go. Because God has given you the authority and do it at work and do it in the school. And do it in arts and entertainment and media. You know, something super powerful. You know what you can do to kick the devil out of your house? Turn your television off. Woo, some of you aren't happy yet. You're not happy yet. You just, whatever it is that's coming through that is not of God, just change it. Just change it. Close the door. Run from it. Turn it off. Get a different media company. Do whatever you gotta do. And so we're, we're worshiping and I, I'm singing the song and they're singing the song Champion. And so I'm singing to the Lord and uh, here is kind of the refrain in the song. You are my champion. We sang it at the Tampa campus. I don't know if you sang it at your campuses at Plant uh, City and South Shore, but we were, we were singing it. Here's the words. You're my champion. So I'm singing to the Lord. Uh, Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I'm seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. I'm so tempted to sing, but I can't. And, and so you know the word. So I'm singing to the Lord and I see the Lord. This is a private moment. So we've had some interaction. There's a private moment. I'm standing right over here. I'm singing and I see the Lord. The Lord said something to me first. He said, I said, you are my champion. And the Lord said back to me, he said, you're my champion. And, and, and I want you to know that Revelation says that God has a name for you. Now, I've known this name for a long, long time, but it's been more than 15 years since he spoke that name to me. It's been 15 years. Revelation says that God has a name for you. It's written on a white stone. And when you pray to him, he'll reveal to you who he says you are. And you, lots of times when God says who he says you are, you go, no, 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 you got the wrong person. Because, because I know me and God says, no, I know you too. And, I, and what I speak over you is bigger than what you see for you. And so he said, you are my champion. And so I waited there for a minute and then I watched him, I, this, this vision like him placing something on my head. And then, and so it's a very private moment. And then the next thing that happened was public and it was recorded. It happened to be recorded. So I wanna show it to you and then I wanna encourage you. And here's what I wanna say. I don't see myself, I don't see myself. I don't, matter of fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change that. I agree with what God says he's gonna do. I agree. I'm not gonna say it anymore that I, I haven't been able to see it. I'm publicly saying, I see it. I see it. I'm agreeing with it. I see it. That's very important. And I believe that my calling is your calling because we're the body. This is, this is our body. I believe it. Very private. Here's the public part. 
Can you turn it up? This, but I'm gonna do it because I just see the pastor of this church. I don't know your name. I forget your name, but you I met you. And I, and I hope I have permission to do this. I don't ever do this. But I see you leading this city into revival. This is your mantle. He's giving you, he's crowning you with confidence tonight. And I saw the Lord, maybe in a picture in my mind, but I saw the Lord crowning you tonight with confidence. And he's placing a mantle on your shoulder. And you will not be able to tell him no. You can't tell him no. This is your calling, your assignment as a family. But I saw you leading the city with a sword in your hand and thousands behind you. And I saw the walls come down with ease. With ease and enjoy, and it's light and a lot of fun. These are the things I'm hearing the Lord speak over you. So pick up the sword! Pick up the sword! So, yeah, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Amen. 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 Something happened. Something happened last night. I was teaching on Saturday night, and and uh, I, I, I'm not positive what happened, um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. My body was quickened in a, in a way. I was. My legs were moving, and I think my knees were up near near my chest. And so here's, here's what I want to give to you. Listen, if that's my calling, it's your calling. Amen, church. Amen, church. Amen. We can't do this alone. God has a work for us to do. And he wants us to go into these mountains and he wants us to see change and revolution. He wants us to bring, and revolution, What I, I don't mean revolution like you're seeing revolution in the streets in 2020. What I mean is more of a covert operation where we go in and we've been praying so much and innocent Susie goes into work and says, yes, I will serve you. And the power of the Holy Spirit goes boom and the whole company changes. So I wanna pray for you first for salvation. Across our campuses, I want to pray for salvation. That's the first thing. That's the very first thing. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want you to say this with me real big. Lord Jesus, come on, real big. Lord Jesus, today I surrender. I give you my life. Every bit of it. Use me. And if that's your prayer for the very first time, giving your life to Jesus on the count of three, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands across our campuses. Come on, on the, on the count of three. One, two, three. Raising your hands wherever you are. Giving your life to Christ. You're saying, today's a day. I give my life to Jesus. Come on, I, I give my life to Christ. Today, I wanna give my life to Jesus. I see you. I give my life to Jesus. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Come on, can we thank the Lord today? Can we give him praise today? All right. Now, I would, uh, here's what I wanna do. In just a second, in just a second, I, I, I wanna stand. And when we stand together, the prayer partners are here. And here's what I'm asking you. Here's, here's what I want you to do. If there's something that you wanna say yes to God for, you say yes, yes in your marriage. And you've been struggling for a long, long time. Yesterday night, there were people at the altar, multitudes of people at the altar and saying, I've just said the enemy, basically, I haven't said a word. And so the enemy's been invading my marriage and he's been coming against me. He's been coming against my wife. He's been coming against, and I, we had wives that were saying, come against my husband. And now we're in disagreement. We've not been talking. And, and in just a second, when we stand, if the enemy has been doing that to you and in your marriage, I want you to come. I want you to come. I want you to, I want you to leave it right here. Matter of fact, why don't we stand right now? Let's stand. And if that's happening, you just come. You just come right now. You say, I'm saying yes to God. I'm saying yes to God. I, I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna answer him. I'm gonna start praying to him. I'm gonna get ready for the fast. If you're, if you're somebody who's never fasted before and you say, I, I can't wait until January, I'm gonna seal my deal. I'm gonna do it right here with a prayer partner. You begin to come now. 
You come now. Some of you are saying, I need to take my place. I haven't believed enough in what God has said about me. Some of you right there, I'm I'm gonna prophesy, there are people in the balcony right now, in the bleachers, and you're saying, people have spoken over you before, you're nothing, you're not gonna amount to anything. I wanna tell you, God said you are something. And God says you have a place. Don't let the devil tell, don't let the devil tell you what your destiny is. God has a place for you. God has a place for you in marriage. He has a place for you in family. He has a place for you in business. God has a place. Don't let your brothers or your sister or anybody else around you determine what your course of action is. We lose in Jesus' name now the ability to receive from God what he wants to give us in Jesus' name. You begin to come now as we pray. You begin to come. If, If you need something from the Lord, we're here to pray. You begin to move.